We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So on this show, you are going to meet people who are making it possible to have life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. People today who are making the words of the Declaration of Independence come true. Hi, my name is Michael Jacoby Brown, and I'm your host for We Hold These Truths. And today we are very lucky and honored to have Ken Galston, the former lead organizer, founder of the Intervalley Project, uh, which has uh, community uh, groups throughout New England. Uh, Ken, welcome. Uh, I wonder if you can just tell us uh, first a little bit just what the Intervalley Project is. Uh, you are the founder and have been for decades the lead organizer. And then we'll talk a little bit more about you personally. Thanks for being here, Ken. Uh, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Uh, Intervalley Project, which I retired from as the lead organizer in June of 2020, is a New England community organizing network. Uh, its first member group is the Naugatuck Valley Project in Connecticut, which was founded in 1983. And that organization helped spawn the growth of similar groups uh, in a variety of uh, southern and northern New England communities. Uh, the original model focused on bringing together congregations, uh, labor union locals, and other groups like public housing tenant organizations to stand up for their own needs and rights in communities that were hard hit at the time by plant closings, uh, the loss of factory jobs. Um, the organizations also from the start had an interest in starting cooperative and democratically owned undertakings such as uh, an employee owned home health care company helping create uh, employee ownership, white and blue collar ownership of uh, industrial jobs, community land trust, cooperative housing. Um, that's some of the background of the organization and uh, it's helped develop scores of talented organizers and leaders over the years, uh, achieved a lot of victories, helped build community across lines of difference. And I'm very proud to have played a role in helping build those groups. More than played a role. I wonder if you can just tell us a little bit about where you come from, Ken, and uh, how you you know got the values you had to do this kind of work for now almost uh, four decades and longer, really, I know. Yes. Uh, you know, when I think about how was I shaped so that I was interested in, in pursuing this work, I really, of course, go back to my roots. Um, I'm Jewish. I'm the children, a child of two parents whose uh, own parents, my grandparents, uh, fled persecution as Jews from different parts of uh, Russia. Um, they came here in their late 1800s, early 1900s. Uh, settled on the Lower East Side and eventually moved to the Bronx. And my parents, therefore, were first-generation Americans. Um, my The values that shaped me um, in some ways are identified strongly with Jewish values, but of course, they're not exclusively Jewish values. They have to do with the dignity of individuals, with mm -hmm. justice, with teaching and learning. And when I think about my parents, who are wonderful people, uh, my father was a doctor and um, had a strong sense of right and wrong. Uh, my mother uh, wrote, uh, but also was a homemaker. And um, two things. My mother's mother died when my mother was 11. And my mother said at the age of 93, before she died, that she continued to think of herself as a motherless child. And practically speaking, what that meant was that when she was in a group, she often was the one that sought out or could identify people who might feel a little bit on the outs, and she connected with them. She was great at building community. And as I said, I think from my father, I got, and from both of them, this strong sense of justice. The one other thing I'd say is that as I went on in my organizing, which went over, as you said, decades, 
I really saw the parallel with healing um, mm. that I think my, you know, exemplified my, my father and as a mm. doctor. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about your first experience, uh, experiences as an organizer and what you learned and uh, who taught you and mentored you along the way when you were younger? Sure. <laughs> you know, I'll just say that as someone in my retirement, uh, as we've discussed, I now I've been co-teaching a course at Tisch College at Tufts University with Danny LeBlanc, an old colleague. And one of the exercises we have people engage in is to write their story of self, mm -hmm. meaning the story of what drew them, how do they think of their first experiences with justice, with bringing people mm -hmm. together. And so for me, in some ways, the earliest experiences that I sometimes use as an example would be gathering neighborhood kids to go shovel out snow from a neighbor right. who might be older mm -hmm. and not able to do it. So that's some of it it's gathering even gathering kids together to do stuff mm -hmm. and, and when you as, got, yeah go ahead sorry i well I, I i'd say were... yeah as a community organizer i yeah. first learned that there was such a thing as getting paid to do this as a college student um in a, a senior seminar um on religion and american life this okay. is in 1967 uh, where I learned about the work of Saul Alinsky as an organizer. And, and I ended up writing my thesis, my honors thesis about him. Hmm. So by the time I graduated from college, I sort of knew all you could know about him from what was published. Hmm. I had spent some time in Rochester, New York, a, a brief amount of time learning about one of his group's fight. Mm -hmm. And so on paper knew a lot about this. I'd also been involved in on campus in trying to bring together students to uh, fight for uh, benefits for uh, people. I went to Brown, to people in Providence um, through the anti-poverty program. In terms of real learning, uh, I would say the first experience was as a VISTA volunteer in North Carolina, mm. in sort of small town, uh, city of 10,000, Clinton, North Carolina, where I got to try out some of what I'd been reading about. Um, but I'd say that in some ways, the most important introductory mentor for me was Dick Harmon, mm -hmm. uh, who was with the Industrial Areas Foundation, Alinsky's group, and at a 10-day workshop for what they thought of as campus radicals, I was coming there as a VISTA volunteer. Harmon talked about organizing as art, as creative work, and that really connected with me. Mm. What 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 was about what Harmon said about creative work? How did that connect or why? I think that until that time, I'd seen it as very interesting um, activity. I saw it as something that I would, as a Jewish kid from Long Island, that being in rural North Carolina was helping me understand America much better. And that even then I thought I would go back and get a graduate degree and teach in a university, mm -hmm. American history or or literature. Harmon talked about his example in the workshop was what does the word issue mean? And mm -hmm. after 10 minutes of people talking about issue as a noun, he finally said, isn't issue also a verb? Mm -hmm. And he then went on to use that to say issues emerge from communities. A good organizer has to immerse themselves in that community, in its mm -hmm. history, in uh, everyday life, in, in what's the background of people. And it's, he used the example of, and this is a little bit arcane, you, an organizer is like a, someone who's sculpting in wood. Hmm. And of course it makes the community too passive, but he hmm. was trying to get at, you have to understand the grain hmm. of the wood. You have to immerse yourself and it's very creative. And I came out of that workshop I remember standing on a, the station of the L, taking me from downtown Chicago to where I was staying, feeling as if I'd met the woman of my dreams. Not, <laughs> not Dick Harmon, but Morgan, I say. Right. Well, that sounds great. And, and can you tell us a little bit about your uh, you know, earliest experiences where you immersed yourself in community and issue was a verb for you? Well, I mean, what I was doing in North Carolina yeah, did fit that. I mean, I was, again, as a, 
uh, a white 21 year old going door to door in this black neighborhood of Clinton, knocking on the doors of, of African American families, um, who I'm sure I would, I, after I got to know people, people said that in the early days, they wondered if I was a revenue agent. Uh, they couldn't quite make sense of who was this guy and what was he doing. Right. But I, um, th that was an early immersion because I really understood that my job was to listen, to gather them together and to see mm -hmm. what they thought of as their most urgent concerns that they wanted to act on. I was there, um, in the months after Martin Luther King had been assassinated, he was April 68, I was there by July. And there had been an outpouring, I understood, of uh, people from the black community when that happened around the courthouse square. Um, and I think people were, you know, it was obviously much bigger than anything I was doing. I think people were sort of primed to speak up. Mm -hmm. And, and where did you go from there? I mean, I, I, I know you've been to Yale School of Management and uh, later founded the Intervalley Project in uh, Waterbury, Connecticut. But I wonder if you can t talk a little bit about where you moved from there before you got into founding the Naugatuck Valley Project. Well, I had, uh, I was, you know, very fortunate when I graduated from Brown, I was one of three seniors who received uh, what was called the Samuel Arnold Fellowship, which was at the time $5,000 and you had to submit a proposal, but you got, it was a traveling fellowship. Um, oh. And uh, I had, between when I submitted the proposal and when I did it, I had really grown interested in the whole question of democratic voice. And so I set out and looked for examples where people had voice over jobs, over their communities. And that meant a year, 11 months in places like uh, Belfast, Northern Ireland, where a very talented organizer, Bob Overy, was from England, was trying to bring together Protestants and Catholics around common community issues. I spent time in what was then Yugoslavia, which had mandated uh, self-managing, self-management structures mm. in schools, factories, interviewing people to understand what was that like. I spent time in West Germany where the allies had mandated that the uh, boards of coal and steel factories, in other words, companies that would be critical to any future war, had to have uh, union representatives on their boards. It was called co-determination with the idea that that might slow down a march to war. Time in Sicily with uh, Danilo Dolce, who was organizing penance, tenants, uh, I mean peasants. So anyway, it was a very rich experience. I came back, yeah. I had gotten connected with the Industrial Areas Foundation through that workshop. They were starting a school as Alinsky was you know, in his 60s to teach organizing to young people. And I spent two years in Chicago organizing with the Midway organization uh, out near Midway Airport with Dick Harmon and then alternating between Dick Harmon and Ed Chambers as my mentors. Mm. And what was that like? Extremely powerful. I learned so much. Again, I was by that time 24. I was working with leaders, blue collar leaders. This was an area of Chicago that was as far south and west of uh, the inner city as you could get at the time. Mm -hmm. Police and firefighters had to live in the city to have their jobs. And because of race, this is where a lot of people moved. And um, a lot of the leaders I was working with were in their 30s, 40s. They were what have been, would have been considered a silent generation. Uh, the people that Nixon uh, and the Republicans were after trying to move Democrats to the Republican Party. And part of the idea was to engage people in public life uh, with the hope that they would, uh, you know, see the value of, uh, that they would, instead of feeling absolutely alienated and driven maybe to uh, that party, that they would feel that they had some agency. So I learned a huge amount working with them on pollution mm -hmm. fights stopping the Crosstown Expressway with a citywide campaign. Yeah, what, what, what would you say you were the main lessons from those years that 
what did you feel like you learned from Harmon and uh, uh, Ed Chambers? And, you know, from doing the work, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the first thing I'd say was you did weekly reflections. You, uh, it was interesting. You actually dictated a weekly report that was typed up uh, by a, a talented office manager and given to Harmon or Chambers. And so the first thing was that you took the time to reflect on what mm -hmm. you were doing. And um, it's key. Yeah. It was absolutely key. Uh, I remember some early examples. <laughs> Uh, Harmon asking me about, uh, did we take time after a given action to do an evaluation with the leaders, which absolutely key. I yeah. mean, some of the stuff you learn from these guys uh, that they had instituted and, and their predecessors was so powerful for any group, whether it's community organizing or anything. So one was evaluation mm -hmm. after the action, you, you leave the yep. room. And I, he said, did I do an evaluation with him? I said, well, you know, we just didn't have time. And he said, God damn it, Galston, the only reason you do the action is so you can do the evaluation. Yep. Um, so the emphasis on leadership development, absolutely key. And learning, obviously. And, and learning. reflection, yeah. Yeah. You know, I think that's, uh, uh, as as you and I know, that that is key and often, unfortunately, sometimes uh, neglected. Yeah. And uh, so why don't you tell us a little bit, uh, you know, if we can fast forward, because we don't have all day, sure. I wish we did, uh, to the founding of the Inner Valley Project and how that came about. Well, I, OK, so I had um, after working with the IAF in Chicago, Minneapolis, Buffalo, I had uh, and sometime with Mass Fair Share, where I learned a lot about labor. Um, I had gone to the School of Management, it was then called School of Organization Management at Yale. I was in my early 30s, wanted to take a break from organizing, wanted to have an option in case I didn't want to organize, and came out of that and decided that, no, I still wanted to organize. I wanted to try out a somewhat different model from what I've been doing with the IAF. At that time, that was all congregation-based. And so I wanted to include congregations, but also labor. I was living in New Haven, the Naugatuck Valley, which begins uh, 12 miles west of New Haven in Derby, Antonia Derby, and goes up the Naugatuck River through Waterbury, the main city, 106,000, I think, at the time, up to Torrington. Um, that seemed like a very powerful place to try to build something. Jeremy Brecker, a wonderful labor historian, uh, had written uh, an oral history, done an oral history project uh, called Brass Valley, and I could learn a lot about it before I even got up there. Um, I began to uh, meet with people from the Catholic Church, the United Auto Workers Union, which had 12 locals in that region, Connecticut oh. Citizen Action Group, and um, the uh, United Church of Christ, and we put together a sponsoring committee. Mm -hmm. We built that, got into a lot of action, um, initially around plant closings, but also around affordable housing, other issues. While I was there, uh, the woman that I am married to now and I had started a relationship. She was working at the Industrial Area uh, Industrial Cooperative Association mm. on employee ownership, and we'd done some work together at Seymour Specialty Wire. We knew over a period of a few years that I was going to be moving to Boston, where she was, and so. Um, Intervalley to start because I raised with the Naugatuck Valley Project leaders that I was going to be heading up to Boston. And they said that they wanted to help me in building a new group. So they paid me full time for two years and allowed me to spend one day a week uh, building Merrimack Valley Project. And they decided that they wanted to recognize that for themselves. So they put it in, in their budget a line item called Intervalley. Oh. Uh, which represented their support for that. Intervalley Project came next, very powerful groups, you know, both of these groups still going, um, and that was my path. While I was at Merrimack, people came to us from Springfield, from Providence, and wanted to build similar groups with a similar model of congregations, labor, economic development, democratic development. So those were the first four groups. Eventually, we were asked by Catholic Campaign for Human Development, a main funder of this work, would we go into northern New England because there were no groups like this? And so we helped build groups in New Hampshire, Maine, uh, and Vermont. 
Right. Can you tell us a little bit more about the structure and even the funding you mentioned, the Catholic Campaign for Human Development, which uh, many of us know for decades has been a major funder of social justice organizations and community organizing. And uh, uh, how that worked with the various organizations, what the funding and structure and staffing was. Yeah, I mean, I would say, first of all, uh, again, we're, we're always building on the shoulders of people come before us. So I knew the model of, of first, the first funding is to, when you're creating a new group is to create, you do it in two stages and you create a sponsoring committee, mm -hmm. which is sponsoring the organizing drive of, of you know, 18 months, two years, leading to the founding of the new community group. Mm -hmm. So the first thing is to see if the sponsors will put up some money, uh, the, the local, uh, say the Office of Social Justice for the Catholic Diocese or Archdiocese in which you're working, will you get money from the Episcopal Diocese from the United Church of Christ? When we started Merrimack Valley Project, we had 11 sponsors, uh, labor union locals, uh, various religious groups, the uh, Reformed Jewish community, for example, add it to that. So that's the first element of funding related to building power and building these groups. That it has to, you have to have some local funding uh, if you're going to build a group that's going to be strong. Over time, you, of course, as you're showing that you can actually achieve something, you're in a better position to go to the national supporters, uh, religious organizations who support this work that have funds you're able to go to private foundations that support this type of work. Mm -hmm. What becomes really critical when you're forming these groups is to set up a due system um, where member, our model was organization of organizations. So the member groups are asked to put up money. They're asked to participate in annual fundraising events. Our groups have followed a, a model uh, of MICA dinners, uh, basically, uh, dinners that honor individuals from uh, the community for their work. Um, and those have been very successful fundraisers, that sort of thing. Oh, uh, that's good. And I wonder, you know, today, a lot of younger, younger organizers, and I know you've been very successful in developing uh, younger people who've led the various projects of the Intervalley Project. Uh, but what would you say are the lessons uh, I mean, I often think now uh, many younger organizers organize through social media as opposed to developing the long lasting and deep relationships that uh, you did, you know, when you have to go talk to a union and, or a, a church leader and ask them for money. That just doesn't happen because they, you know, like your looks or uh, think you have a good idea. Uh, can you tell a little bit about some of the lessons you've learned, which uh, you think are important to pass on? One of the, what are the things that really stick that are uh, really important in developing powerful organizations? Well, a couple of quick things. Uh, you know, part of uh, my perspective on young people coming into this work is on the one hand, there's something to be learned just as I learned from mentors who were 10 or 15 years older than I was, I think there is something to be learned from people of, um, of my vintage, of your, you know, you and I are, are colleagues of similar uh, experience of, of learning and um, about organizing. On the other hand, I feel that it's, uh, there's a value in people feeling that they can shape the organizing as they see uh, changes going on in the country, in society, et cetera. So that's the first thing. Mm -hmm. Having said that, I think that there's no replacing some fundamental practices. And one is learning your own story, you know, being able to articulate fairly briefly how you came to be in this person's living room or meeting with them at Dunkin' right. Donuts. So they build, it builds some trust and it begins to build a sense of reciprocity. That's mm -hmm. number one. Number two is learning how to listen well, how to ask good questions. Uh, your, your individual meeting is not an even exchange. You're trying to understand what 
what is this person facing? How are they shaped so that they might be interested in this work? Mm -hmm. So individual meetings, right? Mm -hmm. uh, second is being able to work with groups, small groups. How mm -hmm. do you help? How do you help a group of people articulate individually what's on their mind and see if they can come to some common agreement about priorities, right? Mm -hmm. um, I would say that the other thing, and these are things that Danny LeBlanc and I uh, practices that we use in our course, courses at Tufts, which is to underscore that community organizing, uh, on the one hand, absolutely exists to win issue campaigns. Um, concrete campaigns that bring about change in people's lives. But that's sort of one element of a triangle. The other two sides of the triangle are building community across lines of difference, mm -hmm. and the other is leadership development. Mm -hmm. So that's what I would say and challenge uh, people coming into this work. Are they doing those three things? It's not that, that if they're not, their work is not to be valued. Um, most of the change that's come about in our lifetime nationally has been through campaigns around identity, the civil rights movement, the women's movement, lesbian, gay, transgender uh, movement, and so on, disabled movements. Those are to be valued, women's movements. Um, those are absolutely to be valued. But community organizing has its own role, and it has to pay attention to these three activities if it's going to be around over 10, 15, 20 years to win, to enforce what it's won and to move on and develop new generations of leaders. Yeah. And how, how do you see yourself? I know you're teaching this course with uh, our colleague and friend Danny LeBlanc at Tufts. What other things uh, do you uh, see yourself doing in the coming years now that you've, quote, retired from being lean organizer at the Inner Valley Project? Uh, well, one of the things that I actually helped start with some classmates at Brown in 2003 is something called the Brown Community Organizing Initiative. Mm -hmm. um, and that grew out of conversations about, uh, you know, we were in our 50s. It led to conversations about what comes next. And one of the ideas that had come up was, could we create an archive? at one mm -hmm. of the libraries at Brown for community organizers' materials. Uh, it grows mm -hmm. the part out of the question of when are you getting this stuff out of the basement? Um, and so we did help create that. Uh, one of the best uh, contributions to that was a series of 100 videotaped interviews uh, done by Don Elmer for the Center for Community Change, a right. diverse group of organizers. That's now at the archive. Oh, We've been organizing workshops for people who teach about organizing in academic settings, everything from community colleges to divinity schools, uh, to learn from each other. And in fact, we have a workshop coming up in two weeks for people to compare notes on uh, what do they think is the most transformative uh, element of their teaching. So I found ways to, to I think, support the movement. Uh, hopefully uh, strengthen it. Uh, the teaching at Tufts, I love teaching out in the street. That's why I didn't pursue the academic teaching. Uh, um, but the Tufts, now that I'm no longer out in the street, um, which I think is fine uh, at, the, at this stage of life, uh, the chance to work with young people, uh, who some of whom come into the class having been organizers in high school, or, or our organizers on campus is a lot of fun. Oh, that's great. Well, we're really honored to have you on uh, We Hold These Truths, Ken Galston, uh, now teaching at Tufts, the uh, founder and former lead organizer of the Inner Valley Project, which is, has done and continues to do a world of good throughout New England. And we want to thank you. And again, I'm Michael Jacoby Brown, your host for We Hold These Truths. We are very glad to have Ken Galston, uh, with us tonight uh, as our honored guest. And Ken, uh, uh, thank you for all you've done. And we look forward to uh, much more good work from you in the years ahead. So thank you. And uh, to those of you who've been listening, thank you for.